Welcome in everybody to another week of UFL Weekly where we kind of gather around and chat about the UFL Weekly. I am Kyle Krajewski joined by Mr. Beautiful, Zach Cole. Zach, how are you my man? I'm doing very, very well. It's finally sunny here in Pennsylvania for uh, a day or two. I think I'm cursing that though because when you guys are getting this pushed out, I'm pretty sure it's going to be raining in Pennsylvania tomorrow. So it is what it is, uh, but I'm going to enjoy the 70 degree weather we had today. Yeah, it was cooking in the mid 70s today. And then, yeah, I think this comes out while it's raining. But either way, beautiful couple of days we had here. It felt nice to be outside, mm-hmm. have the windows open, feel really nice. Uh, finally, finally feels like spring, spring football, right? It sure does. And especially this weekend, uh, it was a beautiful on our end. Beautiful couple days here this weekend, Sunday especially, but especially just overall a beautiful weekend to watch some football. Mm -hmm. Uh, Beautiful, beautiful spring weather. No better day to watch and enjoy some spring football. So let's get into it. We're going to recap a little bit of week two, kind of go through the scores, big plays, um, highlights from each game. Then we're going to preview week three because we are already on to week three. Just do our quick game picks, highlight a little bit there, and then we'll get on with our weeks. So without further ado, we are UFL Weekly. You can follow us on X or Instagram. You can watch us if you are listening to us. You can watch us on YouTube. If you are watching us on YouTube, you can listen to us wherever you get your podcasts. If you just want to hear our beautiful, soothing voices, (laughs) or if you want to see our beautiful faces, find us on YouTube. Let's get into it. Some quick news out of the week two action. Uh, Roughnecks quarterback Jarrett Garantano is out for at least a month Mm. after an injury suffered uh, this past week. Uh, Quarterback Reed Sinet will be the starter moving forward. Uh, I think Garantano went down early in the second half of their game. And a tough break. Tough break for a guy who, I mean, you're starting spring football, getting more tape under your belt. And to go down stinks. Yeah, it it definitely does. I mean, it, it really kind of felt like this week it had a little bit of a cloud over it with some of the injuries we saw. And like Garantano was one of the first ones, but moving into another big one from the weekend with Donald De La Haye, how, aka de- destroying. Um, we we saw him go down and actually fracture something in his neck this week. He was trying to make a tackle on a on a kick return, uh, which. Could have possibly gone for a touchdown, so I'll give him props well. there where, where that was due. Um, but unfortunately, it was not a real pretty tackle. He kind of put his head on, in front of the ball carrier instead of behind and um, ended up fracturing his neck, which is not great. And obviously, that could have gone a million, a million ways more negatively than it did. So happy that that's all it ended up being was just a, a, a crack or a, a fracture somewhere. Um, but this kind of stunk to see for the league. Yeah, destroying kind of a guy making his way on YouTube, um, bringing definitely a lot of eyes to this league. Um, And you can kind of see that from the amount of outlets that posted about his injury. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, it was a rough looking tackle, but I think even he said he's just like, you know, I got to work on that tackling for him. Uh, (laughs) But I have no doubts that this man's going to just try to suit back up as best as soon as possible. We'll probably see him next Next spring, I think he's on IR for a minimum of four weeks, four or five weeks. But I think he said he's he's done for the year. So we'll see. I think I, this isn't the end of his chapter uh, in chasing professional football. Uh, we'll see him come sometime next year for sure. And then yeah, I, next bit of – oh, go ahead. I was just going to say I, I totally agree with you there. I, I think that – He's had such a positive um, impact on the league, and oh, it's yeah. been such a positive path for him. And he earned it. It's not like it's been given to him. So I, I do think we'll see him make a return. For sure. For sure. And then next bit of news here, Brahm has also placed center. Alex Millette onto IR. Uh, tough break for this Brahma's team, uh, especially the Brahma's offense that, I mean, you need your center. Um, so hopefully they uh, this offense doesn't take too big of a hit uh, losing that guy. Yeah. That's Let's get got. in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into week two recap. Uh, just going game by game and starting off 
with probably one of the most exciting games. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess game finishes we'll see uh, this season. Not to say I'm hoping it is, but it's it's a doozy. The San Antonio Brahmas beat the Memphis Showboats 20 to 19 off of uh, the greatest possible way to end and like complete a comeback, which is the the UFLs what they call it an alternate possession, which is mm -hmm. essentially instead of an onside kick, you can just go for a fourth and 15 from the middle of the field. And if you convert, you just keep going. You've got the ball. So we saw that in this game in the final minute. Uh, we saw San Antonio down. Uh, just a quick uh, outline here. San Antonio was down 16-0 to zero at the start of the fourth quarter. San Antonio scored two touchdowns in the final minute of the game to essentially claim the 20 points that they have on the scoreboard mm -hmm. to beat the showboats 20 to 19. Uh, so they basically scored a touchdown and were like, we're going for the fourth and 15 went for it, drove down, scored a touchdown with like X amount of eight seconds left, basically securing the win. Huge, huge thing to see. Uh, I mean, a, a team win from this alternate possession, but I just, I just love it. I love it so much. <laughs> yeah, it's this is like the selling point for why this alternate possession is such a better option than the onside kick because you it take works. a team that was that was down sixteen zero going into the fourth. I, I know sixteen isn't an insurmountable number, but still, with the flow of the game, it wasn't looking good. And this team was able to put a touchdown on the board, give up a, another field goal, even but then score, get the ball back again, and score again in order to win the game. So it's got to be frustrating on Memphis's behalf for, for them to have played a pretty solid game overall. Uh, we'll, I'll mention a couple minutes about their field position, but uh, it, it's got to be frustrating to have played that decent of a game and ended up losing it in the end. But kudos to the Brahmas for not giving up and for playing a full, a full game all the way to the last second. Yeah, it's – I mean – huge i think we we're seeing a lot of really good defense in the ufl overall mm -hmm. um and uh just highlighting here the show showboats offensively started out strong uh started the game with a touchdown and then just kind of settled for field goals the rest of the game yeah uh and that's kind of a an emphasis on the brahma's defense for kind of holding the showboats there but i think we're seeing a little bit of a slowdown on the uh the showboats offense overall mm -hmm. um but that's not to say the Brahmas are perfect offensively either. Uh, they kind of, I mean, they didn't score a point until the fourth quarter. Um, I think we saw Garber specifically, the quarterback for San Antonio, kind of really uh, figure things out late in the game and fortunately not too late, um, mm -hmm. just in time for a win. So uh, two teams that figured things out late or started out a little too hot, um, kind of saw that culminate in a final minute comeback yeah i think that moving forward what we're gonna need to see from that team that's like a real championship threat is quality quarterback play all four quarters because that's something last week and this week where we're kind of waiting for these guys to get going and if that offense can kick from the first couple drives of the game all the way through these teams are going to start to become down or that team whatever team it is that that quarterback steps up is going to start to become dominant and i think garbers is a really good candidate to be that guy i think he's just got to start piecing it together from from the, you know the first whistle yeah and before we spend too much time on the brahmas here uh, this offense is probably my favorite in the league. I just want to yeah. see them uh, dominate and play hot from the start of the game. Um, but I think AJ Smith, the offensive coordinator there, uh, is cooking something up. Uh, and I think we'll we'll see this Brahmas team start balling out as if we haven't already. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, I'll go ahead and I'll introduce our second game of the of the weekend here, Kyle. Um, the St. Louis Battlehawks took on the Arlington Renegades in what was a higher scoring game, uh, something that we haven't really seen yet. Um, it was 27 to 24. The Battlehawks uh, were the, the winners in this game. And again, it was another one where we had a slow start to the game. Both of them were kind of struggling to move the ball. And then as we started to see some defensive plays, it's kind of ignited the offense, which seems to be a theme that we're seeing a lot, the defense igniting the offense. Um, but what did you see in this game? What, what stuck out to you? Yeah, I think uh, 
primarily just again late late offenses um, or slow slow starting offenses. Um, but overall, I think um, Luis Perez on the uh, Renegade side put on a another solid performance. Um, I think he's proving to be a really really good uh, quarterback in this league, uh, as if we haven't seen that in years prior. Um, we've seen, I mean, we see points. I think is the huge thing here. Uh, two teams that are offensively capable of scoring. Um, but primarily one guy stood out to me on the battle Hawk side and that's Marcel Aitman. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he's becoming the guy in St. Louis over Hakeem Butler. That's not to say, I, I think McCarron, I think Hakeem Butler is more able to be completely pushed out of a game. Um, whereas I think Aitman we're seeing is just available. Um, mm-hmm. scored two touchdowns this game on four catches for 144 yards. Uh, I think he's just going to be, I think he's going to be the guy in St. Louis this year. Yeah. And uh, it actually seems like a game Butler's third in line behind Darius Shepard too. It uh, feels Shepard like had nine for 82. Aitman, you mentioned had, uh, four for 114 and, uh, Hakeem Butler had three for 26. So, um, obviously kind of falling down a little bit here but i think that the thing that really you you mentioned with luis perez playing solid we we did not see much of a run game from the renegades in this game um we only saw let me see i see 23 yards 19 yards 16 yards in the box score 23 yards yeah yeah which is just not going to get it done uh you need to have a balanced attack and I think that that's kind of why A.J. McCarron had a little less pressure on him this week because uh, Durant, the running back for the Battle Hawks, actually ended up with 104 um, yards this week, which is huge. That's that's an incredible week since we haven't seen anything like that or we didn't see anything like that in week one. So having a balanced attack is definitely a key. Um, and the Battle Hawks seem to capitalize on it in this one. Yeah, I think uh, we kind of saw that from the – this game being decided by a walk-off field goal from the Battle Hawks. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of a close game just throughout. Um, I think the uh, they kind of almost traded shots back and forth where ultimately the Battle Hawks came away with the, the final game-winning shot. Yeah, this is kind of a tough start for the Renegades too. 0-2 against two very good teams. Um, they'll, yeah. they'll be back. It's There's enough games that they'll, they'll bounce back. They are thankfully not down for the count. Uh, that's the beauty of it being a early in the season, but also mm-hmm. I think every team is just playing so close. I mean, we've seen it with every game this year so far. I mean, the furthest margin of victory this week was the, this next game, uh, Stallions over the Panthers, over by seven. So we're seeing a lot of close games this season uh, mm-hmm. in the UFL, and it's perfect. It, it leads to these last second victories, these close matchups that you're just like actually in, engaged in and like, all right, cool. I'm looking forward to what the next quarter is because it's mm-hmm. not uh, 28 to three at the end of the halftime. It's we, we've got some competition between all these teams and it's beautiful. Uh, mm-hmm. can't, can't ask for anything better as a fan of the league <laughs> as a whole. Uh, Definitely not. I teased it next game that happened this week, kicking off Sunday. Birmingham Stallions defeated the Michigan Panthers 20 to 13. Uh highlight here truthfully the the large takeaway here is that Jake Bates kicker for the Panthers <laughs> is just a maniac. Back-to-back weeks with 60 plus yard field goals. Last week he hit 64, this week he had a 62 yard field goal. This dude uh, I mean Props to him I, uh, to go out there and just even have the like, <laughs> the guts to go for it for over 60, yeah. both him and the coach. Props to them. Uh, I saw a note that this only happened once in the history of the NFL where a kicker kicked uh, back-to-back 60-plus yard field goals successfully, I think. Um, only happened once. I think it was 2017. Mm. But either way, Bates is making a name for himself. There was a lot of a lot of attention on him specifically in this game, and I think it's well deserved. That's freaking awesome. Yeah, it's it's kind of it says something if you're the kicker and you're you're 
the the main talk of the game in a game that you lost you know he's he's really kind of special and i think much like uh we saw out of the usfl with brandon aubrey i think we're going to see something similar with jake bates where some someone's going to give this guy a shot and invite him to camp and let him see what he can do and like we saw with aubrey it, it, it panned out the season he was fantastic for the cowboys and it's really kind of just proving that there is talent in in the kicking department, especially it's not just these washed up guys or these guys that couldn't land yeah. a gig. It's there's there's some real talent to be discovered. And even on the other side of the ball, I'm shouting out Pitt right here. Chris Blewett, uh, the kicker for the um, the Stallions, uh, was a f- perfect four for four in this game. Um, Pitt alum, shout out Chris Blewett, beat Clemson. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it, this game was really kind of just the Stallions kind of just leaning on the Panthers throughout this game. The Panthers defense showed up again. It was good again in this game and their special teams, obviously with Bates was good, but uh, again, Birmingham is very, very talented as a team and they just kind of leaned on the Panthers defense and their offense just couldn't strike back. So that's ultimately what made the difference in this game. Yeah, I think two large takeaways from me in this game is that this Michigan Panthers defense is phenomenal. Very Um, good. Mm -hmm. Sure. Stallings beat them by seven, but that's not to highlight that they held the pan- the Stallions to having to kick four field goals. Yep. Um, they just kind of held held their held their own in the uh, the red zone specifically, um, but just kind of getting them to the end zone or the red zone, I should say, mm-hmm. uh, was the I guess their limitation there. They were like, "All right, we'll get you here," but that's about it. Um, and the Stallions were just like, all right, cool. We'll just kick them. Um, Stallions, again, used two quarterbacks. I think we saw this last week a little bit early on. Um, but I think we're it's going to be – we're going to see this every week this season yeah. uh, between Martinez and Corral. Um, both quarterbacks couldn't fully get it done in the air. Um, Martinez led the team – I led the team or led the two uh, in yards with 88, both kind of completing – around 50% completion percentage. Mm -hmm. Um, But one highlight here is that Martinez was the team's leading rusher. And on the season, uh, Maribel, Stallions running back, and Adrian Martinez are the league's leading rushers in in rushing yards. So (laughs) love to see that the quarterback, the, I guess, QB2 or QB half, uh, one and a half for the Panthers is second in the rushing yard department for the UFL as a whole. Um, but I think we're going to see that kind of every week this season between for mm-hmm. um, from the Stallions is this uh, this two QB system. And if it continues to work, why fault it? Yeah, sometimes if any if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. I mean, that's, the, that's the old saying. <laughs> The Stallions are now sitting at 2-0 uh, along with the Brahmas, and the majority of the league is sitting at 1-1. One one. Um, but t- moving into a game that unfortunately features an 0-2 team, uh, the Houston Roughnecks played the D.C. Defenders this weekend on uh, in the final game of the weekend on Sunday, where they fell to the Defenders 23-18. to um, This game was kind of... It was a little back and forth. We saw the game tied 12-12 uh, going into half, which kind of just <laughs> speaks to the offense again in this one, that it was 12-12. You know, we're not seeing any like 20 to 14 score the half or anything. It's yep. it's usually pretty low scoring. But um, Houston ended up scoring in the third quarter uh, and then got shut out for the rest of the game. And obviously, D.C. Um, ended up tacking on more points than that. They tacked on 11 points in the fourth quarter, which ended up giving them the win. So they fell behind in the third, ended up coming back in the fourth, and took the victory 23-18. to 18. Yeah, and a, a huge, I guess, uh, hey, I guess a huge factor in that fourth quarter for the, um, or I guess in the third <laughs> specifically, for the defenders that kind of helped set up the victory was the uh, – the forced fumble and recovery. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a huge play. I'm completely blanking. I again, I should have these, but I don't. Um, I'll find it for you. I think it was Pledger. It, either way, huge play for the um, for the Roughnecks. They would had probably like 60 yards gained on it, but at the end of it, um, the defenders just came up, forced the fumble, 
uh, and recovered it right there, just basically wiping out a huge play from the Roughnecks and just claiming it back for their own, basically setting up the uh, setting up a scoring drive for the defenders and helping them claim that uh, that overall just dominance in the fourth quarter. Um, did you find it or are you still searching it? Um, I'm still looking for it. Um, <laughs> all right. Either way, I'll get to it in a second. <laughs> either way, huge defensive play, um, for the defenders. Um, just watching this game, it's still very, very clear that this defenders team is missing Abram Smith. Uh, I think the offense as a whole is still, still a little shaky. Um, not looking too perfect on either end. Uh, Teamo looks, looks good. Uh, but still, I think overall the offense is, is just looking a little, little rocky. Um, and then the Roughnecks saw we spoke about it earlier. Uh, lost their starting quarterback Garantano uh, at the start of the second half, where I mean, Reed Sinet jumped in and played some really good football. Uh, threw for two twenty one and a touchdown in replacement just in the second half. So I think this is not a bad. Uh, I guess replacement QB um, jumping in here for the Roughnecks. It was DeAndre Baker that forced the fumble, and it, it's worth mentioning, bringing up again because that that play really was a momentum swing. That was a like a mm-hmm. seventy yard breakaway touchdown. They they hit a guy, uh, a receiver going up the middle, and he weaved in and out of like two or three defender defenders and ended up getting hawked down by DeAndre Baker on what was going to surefire be a touchdown. So. Um, and that forced the fumble and that kind of swung the momentum of the game. So that, that really, I think was the defining play of that game. Yeah, it was like you said, it the momentum swinger, the, mm-hmm. uh, fourth quarter comeback, uh, they, they needed that play and they got it. Um, yep. uh, just leading to the defenders victory and making them a perfect 10 and O at Audi field, uh, as the defenders have existed which is crazy. I also think uh, we would be very remiss if we didn't mention that there was a pretty incredible beer snake that was running through the crowd. Uh, oh, happy to see Sunday. it back, man. <laughs> it's beautiful. If you are not familiar with the beer snake, uh, I think we've mentioned it before. It is the entire crowd of the defenders just gathering the beer cups um, <laughs> and just stacking. It makes just one long weaving beer snake. snake and you <laughs> see it in the you see it in the stands you see it in the crowd you can't not watch the a defender's home game and ignore it they hone in on it the defenders <laughs> love it they're just it's it, it started in 2020 it's awesome and it's just continues to exist and it's, it's beautiful i'm so happy it continues to exist uh, a dc tradition <laughs> It sure is a DC football tradition uh, for games played in DC and not wherever the Washington Commanders play. <laughs> All right, uh, Kyle, let's flip our sights here. I think we've gotten through everything in the uh, the week two recap, so let's flip our sights to week three. Does that sound like a plan? Sounds like a deal. All right. Well, looking ahead, uh, we do have another four game slate this weekend. Uh, not Love that it. I don't think, uh, not that I think we have any weekend. Don't worry about games, it. But um, <laughs> looking at Saturday, uh, the first game, I'm just going to run through all the games real quick, Kyle, and then we'll we'll go back and we'll do our picks after that. Um, Deal. On the Saturday, the two games are the DC Defenders at the Arlington Renegades at 1 p.m. Uh, then you get a nice long break until 7 p.m. on uh, Saturday where the Memphis Showboats take on the Birmingham Stallions. And then on Sunday, the two matchups, uh, 12 o'clock noon game is the Houston Roughnecks and the Michigan Panthers. And then the 3 o'clock game, a very good game on in the afternoon, is the St. Louis Battlehawks and the San Antonio Brahmas. So um, that is our slate for this upcoming weekend. So let's hop back to the beginning. Let's talk about our picks here. Uh, we have the DC Defenders taking on the Arlington Renegades. The Defenders are two point favorites, meaning that they are minus two, and the Renegades are plus two. And the over under is set at forty three and a half. Where are you going? Let's see. We've got a one and one Defenders team facing an zero and two Renegades team. I'm going to take Arlington plus two. Hmm. I think I don't know. I think Arlington is seeking a win. 
I think both teams kind of view this as a rivalry week. Uh, defenders kind of looking for a rematch of the XFL championship game last year, hoping to claim the victory. But I think the Renegades are looking for their their first win on the season. Defenders look a little rocky. So I'm going Renegades plus two. Give me the over. I'll take the over. I think these teams I think these teams can score when they need to. So I'll get sure. Give me the over. We saw the Renegades put up a good number of 24 points this past week. I think. Yeah. You can I keep like up. That. Well, I am gonna go opposite of you for the exact reason you did bring up. Ooh. I'm gonna say that the defenders are gonna uh cover the spread here at minus two. So give me the defenders minus two. And I'm also going to take the over 43 and a half. Uh, I do see this being a higher scoring scoring game. But one thing we know about Arlington from last year is that they are a slow starting team. So I'm not sure if this is going to be the week that they put together their first win or even a cover for that matter. So I'm going to go ahead and take DC minus two. Beautiful. Next game on Saturday at 7 p.m., as you've already said. Uh, we've got the one and one Memphis Showboats against the two and oh perfect Birmingham Stallions. The line is currently set at Stallions minus seven, over under set at 41. Zach, let's hear your picks. Hmm. This one's tricky. Um, and I, in my heart, I'm really thinking that seven points is a lot in the UFL, but. Birmingham is also far and away the best team, I think. So I'm going to go ahead and take Birmingham minus seven. Seven is a lot now that I'm saying that out loud, but I think I'm going to stick with it. And in the over-under department, I will go ahead and take the over uh, 41. I, I think Birmingham tends to put up a lot of points, and that's mostly why I feel okay taking them at minus seven. Um, so give me over 41 and Birmingham minus seven. Yeah, that, that seven points is tough to uh, take an under it on. Is. Um, however, I'm going to do that. I'm taking Birmingham minus seven, and I'm going to take the under, under 41. Wow. I think this Birmingham team just tramples the showboats for some reason. I'm picturing it. Picturing a 10-point win. Count on it. 10-point dub Ooh. from the Stallions. Do not bet this. This is just a gut feeling. <laughs> um, All in a shot. Something we got to pre- preface here again. These are not betting. This is not betting advice. This is Zach and I just making our quick picks. Uh, we're not begging you to make our make these bets. Um, we actually aren't doing too hot. I think, <laughs> I think we're both <laughs> we are not. about breaking even, uh, if that. So this is just our, our quick way of saying like, oh, this is what we expect out of this game. Yeah. Uh, based on Vegas lines. So, Yeah. Birmingham minus seven, under 41, 10 point dub. Count on it. <laughs> All right. Well, the next game, uh, the Houston Roughnecks are taking on the Michigan Panthers. Uh, two game, two teams that we're not really sure what to make a ton of yet. Um, this is the 12 o'clock Sunday game. So, Kyle, where are you going? I'm sorry. I should go introduce the lines to the. Uh, Please it, do. <laughs> sorry. The spread is three points right now in favor of Michigan. Um, and that great defense that we've seen. And the over-under is set at 38 and a half. Go ahead. Now now you can give me your picks. Oh, thank you. Now I know what to pick. Um, I'm going to take Houston plus three. I'm picturing an offensive renaissance with uh, Reed that taking over on offense. I, I think things start to click a little bit more here for them, and they pick up the pace here. Maybe not winning. But I think they can keep it a close game. Um, and because these defenses, especially the Michigan defense, I'm going to take the under. Under 38 and a half. Very interesting. And I think that I'm going to go Panthers minus three. I'm feeling them. I, I like what they're doing. Okay. I think maybe okay. the offense finds the end zone a couple times this week. And I think Jake I like Bates that. nails another 60-yarder. <laughs> Yeah, that's you know what the spread is. The spread is Jake Bates three points field Whoa. goal. That's you remove spread. Jake Bates swings. I mean, swings the other way. So give me the Panthers minus three, and I will stick with the under as well. Uh, under 38 and a half. All right, final game of the weekend 
we've got the St. Louis Battlehawks at one and one taking on the perfect two and zero oh San Antonio Brahmas. Oh, this is going to be a good one. Uh, is- Battlehawks are the favorite at minus two with a minus two spread over under set at 42. What you got? They're, they're telling me to take the, the Brahmas here. They really are. I mean, how do you take a team that's two and O is looking fantastic in the league is, is, you know, is doing their thing and you make them the underdog. I, I just, I do it. I, I'm going to go ahead. I'm, bro. I'm falling for the trap. Give me, give me the Brahmas plus two. And I feel pretty comfortable on the over on this one. I, I I'm like in a decently high scoring game, uh, kind of like we saw with the um, uh, the Battle Hawks this week. So, give me the over forty two. Zach, I hate to say it, I'm agreeing on both accounts. <laughs> this is not. This isn't the St. Louis Battle Hawks full offensive showdown, and maybe it is. Maybe we get 30 points from San Antonio or from St. Louis, but I think we get 31 from San Antonio. I think these are probably two of the better offenses in the game. And because of that, we're going to get the, we're going to get this over easy. Uh, I just also love San Antonio keeping the streak alive, stay undefeated against an XFL foe in St. Louis and uh, stay perfect. San Antonio, I'm rooting for you. (laughs) So yeah, San Antonio plus two. Over 42. Easy. That wraps us up. It sure does. Thank you for tuning in. We will we'll talk week three next week. We'll do a quick recap like we did next week. And we'll do a week four preview next week. Thank you for tuning in. Um, Zach, it's always a pleasure, my man. It's always, um, always is. You, the listener or the viewer, we appreciate you as well. Um. Give us a like, a comment. Tell us um, your favorite part of week two or what you're looking forward to the most in week three. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being here. Thank you for mm-hmm. being a part of this this audience. We really appreciate it. Not only because it makes us happy to see numbers go up, but it also just makes me happy that there is this audience for the UFL because Absolutely. we love this league. We love spring football. And we just love sharing this pleasure with as many people as we can. And we want it to stay. We want it to be here for a while. Please. All right. Again, thank you for tuning in. Talk to you next week. See you.